in the words of Isaiah, he prophesied and gave these words, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Listen diligently to me, eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. That uh, this invitation that Isaiah uh, spelled out was the invitation from God to come to him, that in him we find our satisfaction and our fulfillment. And uh, here it talks about um, what was they could see as the ways of, that they would be satisfied, that God fulfilled in much a uh, fuller way than that. Oh, yeah.
Our Lord Jesus Christ said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, Lord have and mercy upon us, and right all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. The Church's Prayer for this Sunday. O Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may, that may both perceive and know what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfil them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. The reading today is from 1 Corinthians, uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 to 34. The Lord saw. In the following instructions, however, I do not praise you, because your meetings for worship actually do more harm than good. In the first place, I have been told that there are opposing groups in your meetings, and this I believe is partly true. No doubt that there must be divisions among you, so that the ones who are in the right may be clearly seen. When you meet together as a group, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For as you eat, you each go ahead with your own meal, so that some are hungry while others get drunk. Haven't you got your own homes in which you eat and drink? Or would you rather despise the church of God and put to shame the people who are in need? What do you expect me to say to you about this? Shall I praise you? Of course I don't, for I have received from the Lord the teaching that I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. This means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It follows that if anyone eats the Lord's bread or drinks from his cup in a way that dishonors him, he or she is guilty of sin against the Lord's body and blood. So then, you should all examine yourselves first, and then eat the bread and drink from the cup. For if people do not recognize the meaning of the Lord's body when they eat the bread and drink from the cup, they bring judgment on themselves as they eat and drink. This is why many of you are weak and ill. Several died. If we could examine ourselves first, we would not come under God's judgment. But we are judged and punished by the Lord, so that we shall not be condemned together with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather together to eat the Lord's Supper, wait for one another. Anyone who is hungry should eat at home, so that you will not come under God's judgment as you meet together. As for the other matters, I will settle them when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hope it's built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith. Well, we thank you that there is this wonderful opportunity to come into your holy presence. Thank you that you communicate with us in and through your word. And as we look at what it means of sharing in the Lord's Supper, that you would teach us, you would help us to understand your word for us, and also to apply that to our situation and our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. You might find it helpful to um, look at the passage that Laura read for us, and it's on page 215 of the Church Bible. We're following in the, in the series of uh, looking at some of the basics of, of worshipping God. And so we, we saw uh, the words about baptism, and uh, last week it was a word of worship, and this morning we're looking at Holy Communion. Now there's different words that, that are used to refer to Holy Communion. So it's the words uh, uh, which are used are, are the Lord's Supper, breaking of bread, uh, the Eucharist, which just means thanksgiving, um, agape meal, which agape is, is, is the Greek word for love, and um, love not just with somebody that you like, but love in, in actually loving somebody who, who uh, you would even hate you. It, it's a different kind of love, the love of God, which is, which is so far um, a love for the unlovely, as it were, is uh, his deeper love for every an unconditional love and uh, so it's an agape meal and also uh, the word that we often refer to as holy communion but they all refer to the same thing the same special meal that we share in especially in the Christian um, worship the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion is very well known now the Roman Catholic Mass is um, slightly different or, or differs in, in a huge way in um, although the, those are the same elements the meaning of it the belief in it is very different and uh, that, that is uh, if, if you've read of church history that is that's been something which which has caused splits and it, and people have been martyred for their faith and just in in um, standing up for those actual words of, of, uh, of those words of this is my body or this is my blood people have lost their lives in, in, in order to stand for that that was where part of the Re Reformation came in where the Ch Church of England the Protestant Church broke away from the, from the Catholic Church so th there is a long history to this and, and, and a difference in, in belief as well between the, what was known as the Roman Catholic Mass and, uh, and the Protestant Lord's Supper. Well, the Lord's Supper is what Jesus himself instituted, as uh, we heard in those words of 1 Corinthians 11.23. The early church were, were devoted to it because they broke bread, and it says, and they broke bread in their homes with glad hearts and generous hearts. And um, Paul here writes of the Corinthians. So in their worship, they were also breaking bread. They were also following the Lord's Supper. So it was a pattern of worship which had been followed through from the time of Jesus. Jesus began it and, and he instituted it. It followed on with, with the disciples. It followed on with the early church. And then also here we see that uh, the Corinthians were continuing with that as well. Well, what is the Lord's Supper. We're going to be looking at that from, from these words in Corinthians of um, the meaning of it and what we believe about the Lord's Supper for ourselves. It is a special meal that's given by Jesus. So there in verse 23, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. So the Lord's Supper was inaugurated, it was instituted by Jesus himself. And Paul says on the night that he was betrayed, on that night when he shared that Passover meal in the upper room with the disciples. It was then when Jesus was sharing this love feast 
this agape feast. It was on that night when disciples around him were actually going to be betraying him. So there was going to be one who betrayed him, there was going to be others who denied him, and yet in the midst of that, that environment, which would have been quite hostile, Jesus shows his love. On that night, he institutes this, this, uh, this agape meal. So it began with him. And what Paul says that, that is, is that this was this ordinary Passover meal, but Jesus makes it a special Christian meal. So he takes the bread, he, he separates it from the Passover bread that they've been sharing. He takes it apart, he sets it apart. He gives thanks or blesses that bread and the wine. And it says Jesus broke the bread and he said the words, this is my body, this is my blood. So he uses those very same elements, those ordinary elements that were on the table the bread and the wine. There wasn't nothing, anything special about them. It would have been just what they'd obtained locally. And Jesus uses these in, in instituting this, this, uh, this very special meal. The bread and wine. They're not uh, literal because they have, when Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood, he is standing there in front of them. They can see that he is alive and well before them. So when he says, this is my body and this is my blood, it, it's, he, it's symbolic, it's referring to, to that. He's saying, this represents my body. This is um, my, my, my body which will be broken for you. This is my the wine representing my blood which will be poured out. If, um, if I showed a, a, a photo of myself to, to someone on, on, on my phone, I said, uh, here, have, have a look at, look at this picture uh, of me. Now, that isn't literally me. Um, that, that is just a picture, that is just an image of me. Because I'm still there in person to the person who, who I'm showing it to. And Jesus was, was saying, look, this is my body and this is my blood. It, it was a representation of them. Remember me by this and not not, it wasn't the actual, that wasn't his actual blood or that wasn't his actual body. So, there is, we do have to, um, yeah, so, so we do have to um, see that those words are not literal, which, which is where some of the misunderstandings, some of the different beliefs have come about, where with other, some of the other uh, denominations, especially the high end of the Anglican Church or the Catholic Church, they would say that this is literally the blood and the body of Christ when you are sharing with that. It actually changes into that form, which is very different to, to uh, how we believe. So Jesus was dramatizing, dramatizing what would actually take place. He was saying that this is my body, uh, speaking of his body that would be broken, speaking of his blood that would be shed in those hours that followed, that he would be arrested, he would suffer, he would be tried, and then he would be executed on the cross, where his body would be physically broken, where his blood would be shed. So he is pointing to that. That is what is going to happen. And so when we look at uh, the, some of the verses that refer to that, in Colossians, uh, Sorry, let me just go back. Uh, so, so when we when we think of that, it, it is showing that this isn't um, some something literal, but this is something that Jesus is is representing what it has happened, and uh, this is is something that Jesus Himself initiated. It's uh, secondly a meal on Jesus's death, um, centered on His death. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, in verse 23 and 24. And then, um, in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This was taking place in the midst of this Passover celebration. And they were remembering in the Passover what God had done for them. 
or done with their ancestors many years ago. That uh, in the time when they were under Pharaoh, God had led them out. God had rescued them. And the way that he would rescued them was to have this, this Passover lamb that they had to sacrifice. They had to eat of that lamb and they had to eat of the, of, of the bread. And in following that pattern, sheltering under the blood of the lamb, they were rescued from, from the clutches of Pharaoh. They were remembering that, that Passover. They were remembering that Passover on that regular basis. And Jesus is using that to say, this is my body that is going to be broken. This is my blood that is going to be shed. He is, he is, this is a meal centered on him himself. This is what he would do on the cross. In writing to the Colossians, on the next uh, slide. Uh, next one. In writing to the Colossians, Paul writes, You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of the flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And in Matthew, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So both those, those elements, his, his body being broken, is making that reconciliation. It is, it is where we were alienated from God, where we were separated from God by our sinful nature, by his body, by that punishment, we are brought back to him. And by his blood being shed. So those elements... They are symbolically showing this is what Jesus has done for us on the cross. This is what he would be doing, he was saying, on that, on that Passover night. We turned our backs on God, on his love. We rebelled against him and deserved his punishment. But Jesus himself went to the cross voluntarily. He gave his life on our behalf in order that we could be accepted as holy and blameless and come into the presence of God. So this blood, um, this bread and this wine, it's, it's a representation. It's visually showing us what Jesus has done. It, it's showing us this is what he's done for us on the cross. And so by receiving it in faith, we are saying that Jesus has died for my sin. We are admitting that we need that forgiveness we need to be accepted by God. And it's only by the cross, by his death, that we are accepted by, by him. So uh, there's the actual event. It is all centered upon the death of Christ. It's a special meal which is centered upon the cross. So as much as we, we share in the bread and wine, it is pointing us back to the cross. That is where the cleansing take, takes place. That is where our sins are forgiven. That is where the, the uh, reconciliation takes place. In those words of Colossians, in those words of, um, of Matthew, that forgiveness is all done for us at the cross. So if somebody just um, not believing in that, by just taking those elements, they are not going to be cleansed by that. They are not going to be forgiven. It requires that faith that Jesus died on the cross for them. It requires that faith that Jesus, that they are forgiven by his blood being shed on the cross on their behalf. So it is the cross that it points us to. It is also one that we are to remember. In remembrance, do this, in remembrance of me. We're all prone to forgetting. I'm sure even the ones with the sharpest minds here are do forget from time to time. That's the reason we have to have our notices, that we, that's the reason we have to have our rotors, that's the reason we have our diaries and calendars. We need those reminders time and time again of what, is, uh, what needs to be done. Um, some of us who have those um, medications, we have the, the little boxes to make sure we take the right medication each day in order that we don't, don't forget. Well, we can forget things and it would be dreadful, wouldn't it, to, to forget the most important thing that we needed to know. 
it would be dreadful to forget uh, the greatest love for us, to forget that. And yet we do. And we, we are in danger of doing that more and more. We can, we can forget, forget about it, we can minimise it, or we can marginalise it, we can think it's not so important, I've got other more important things to do. So we can push it out of the way, as it were. So Jesus gave this as a remembrance, as a regular remembrance, that he died on the cross in order to save, save us. And this command of using the bread and the wine to do this in remembrance of me is to recall to our memory that this has really happened. He did this for me. And when we talk about it as a remembrance, it's not just as the word memory. Memory is just recalling something. But this is reliving or entering into what really happened. So thinking quite deeply about what took place and then, and then thinking that through of how that affects us, how that changes us in our belief and our understanding. <coughs> Just recently, that um, Lynn and I were um, out in, in the area of Kent and East Sussex, and there are these lovely castles and medieval kind of um, things that, that, that go on in those areas. And one of the things that they do is have a, a reenactment of a battle. Um, and, and they, they have this reenactment where people dress up with all the armour and, uh, and all, like uh, the, the soldiers of that time, and, and they act out this the the Battle of Hastings or other other skirmishes that, that took place. And what they're doing is entering into the atmosphere, the environment, to to remember this is what happened in their history in at that time in that very place remembering in order to, to, see, to, to see that people won this battle by, by losing their lives, they, the, the sacrifice they made and all those other things. Well, Jesus wanted us to remember this meal. He knew it was so important and that is why he's given this special meal for us to remember it afresh and we enter into it. We enter into it with our hearts, with our minds, we engage our faith and we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we do that with the aid of the words which are spoken in the communion. We have that visual re reminder with, with the wine and with the bread. And we engage our senses by tasting, by eating, by drinking. And so we are appropriating it for ourselves. We are thinking that this is actually for me personally, as we, as we take part in all of this, we are, it is a deep remembrance. So it's far more than just a memory of that we just you know, casually walk up and take this, um, you know, take a sip of this wine and, and or like um, sometimes we do these school assemblies where, where all the children come up, um, you know, let me just have a sip of the wine. It's not like that. This is a serious reminder that Jesus died for us. And as we do that, we are remembering, look, this is the sacrifice that Jesus has, has paid. This is the price he's paid in order that I can come into his presence. So it is a special rem a remembrance, a deep remembrance by trusting and in faith. It is a special meal that we partake of and that we proclaim. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Paul writes in the previous chapter in 1 Corinthians 10, and also in, in 1 Corinthians 11, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For us often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This remembrance meal is to be partaken of regularly on a regular basis. The early, early church, as I said before, they devoted themselves to breaking bread, both formally and informally, also in their homes. In uh, the Bible, it doesn't state how often we should, we should 
take part in communion, whether it should be daily, whether it should be weekly or annually. Um, there, is, there is this um, note in, in the, for, the, for Anglicans. So in the Anglican prayer book, those who have uh, been brought up on that, you may have read these verses. It says this, and note that every parishioner shall communicate in at least three times in the year, of which Easter to be one. So, so what that's saying is, is that um, for an Anglican, the, the traditional Anglican member, the Church of England member, you had to take communion three times in the year, and at least one of those times was Easter. So every Easter, that uh, all parishioners should be taking communion. And we are all communicant members, or we are all to be communicant members when we sign up on the electoral roll. It means that we are communicant members when we um, offer ourselves for PCC, when we offer ourselves to serve in, in the church. It means we're all uh, communicant members, that we are taking part in the whole worship of the church. So that means we are to, to participate in communion on a regular basis. That's meant to be part of our fellowship. So, so it is a regular thing that uh, we are all to do for those who, who are communicant members, those who are on the electoral roll. That's a kind of requirement. Of, that is a basis of faith. So to partake of communion, what does that mean? Paul gives us what it shouldn't be in those verses in 1 Corinthians 11. So it, he says in verse 18 and 19, it shouldn't be a meal which is shared when there are factions and divisions in the fellowship, in verse 18 and 19. And it shouldn't be shared in a way that it's selfish and worldly, because there in their midst there were people who were rich, there were those who were poor, and those who were rich, who were, were saying, were almost kind of meeting separately, in a separate lounge, as it were, to those who were poor. And there was this separation of status between those who were sharing at the same table. It was not meant to be a meal that fed you physically. There in verse 20, 22 and verse 34, if someone is hungry, then eat, eat and drink at home, says Paul. And um, he also goes on to say, partaking. Um, if you're doing those things, in verse 20, it, it's not the Lord's Supper that you are sharing. So just sharing in those elements without that faith and understanding doesn't mean that it's the Lord's Supper. He said, saying you are denigrating it. You're just not sharing in the same meal. What you are doing is something completely different. You are share, partaking in something which is unworthy because it's unworthy. It's not worthy of what God or Christ has done for us on the cross. We're not recognising the seriousness of it, the importance of it, by doing and sharing in such a way. So there is a wrong way of sharing, but there is also a right way. Firstly, it's all about coming together. In those verses in, in chapter 11, Paul lists at least five times, he says, when you come together, when you come together. So, so it's, it's about people. The, the believers coming together. It's, a believer, it's, it's about um, those who trust in Christ all coming together in faith. So we, when we come to share it in fellowship, we come to him, we come together. So it is one of unity. It is a witness of our unity. So regardless of our differences, regardless of our the diversity, what it's showing is that when we come together, we are one in Christ. So we may be so different from one another. Normally we wouldn't have met one another. But when, in, when we are in Christ, this meal is showing that we are actually one. That we have a unity which is far greater than anything else. So Paul emphasises, especially there to the Corinthians, when you come together, it is something of coming together. It is it shows our unity to everyone. It is a witness to our unity, and it is our unity. He calls up, um, the Corinthians to examine themselves in verse 28. So we are to think about our standing before God. Are we, 
Are, are we continuing in sin or are we repenting of our sin? Have we turned our back on, on those things which, which are wrong? Um, he, he's saying, are we, are we um, thinking of, of Christ dying for us and then continuing in, in a wrong way? So to consider all of that when we come before God in, in sharing the, the Lord's Supper, to examine ourselves, not, not to forget the forgiveness that we have received, not to show that we need to continually be trusting God in our faith. And in partaking, to wait for one another in verse 33. This is not just politeness that, you know, you go before me, um, I'll give you that space, but, but this is valuing one another, what others before ourselves. This is what Jesus himself did. He valued us far greater than his life. So he gave his life in order for us. And this is also about valuing others greater than ourselves. So all of these things means that, uh, that we are partaking when we think about it in such a way. Whoever feeds on my flesh and eats and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. It says in, in John chapter 6 that when, by eating and drinking we are actually feeding on Christ or he feeds us spiritually by faith. So as um, we, we meet at the Lord's table, He is strengthening us by His Holy Spirit. We are being strengthened in our faith. We are being assured for the forgiveness of our sins. We are assured of the promises that He's given us, that He's with us to the end of the age. All of those things, all the benefits of the cross are being poured out to us in and through that meal. We are in communion with Christ Himself when we partake of the Holy Communion. And so for that reason, we do need to guard it, we do need to protect who comes and shares at the table. That if there's a sin which hasn't been resolved, if somebody is unrepentant, then that needs to be sorted out before we come to the Lord's table. That those things need to be, to be shown. There needs to be a heart of repentance, a willingness to repent. But it is a place for those who are unworthy, like us. Those who are worthy don't need the Lord's Supper. But there is nobody who is worthy. It is for those who are unworthy. It is for sinners who, who show that need for forgiveness and forgiveness of Christ. So the Lord's Supper, as we partake, God is ministering to us in and through that. And He ministers to us in such a way which is so different in the way that he answers prayer, in the way that we receive that through Bible study, in the way that we would uh, receive that through fellowship. The way that we are ministered to by Holy Communion is something, something completely different and something that we is essential for our faith, which we are commanded to do. And then to go on to proclaim. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus um, showing visually by his broken body and his broken blood says this is for all. And every time we do that, we are visually saying to, to everyone, this is what Jesus has done for you and for me. That he has died on the cross for you and for me. That his blood was shed, his body was broken. So this is the good news that has been proclaimed every time that we share in, in, uh, in the Lord's Supper. And there is in that parable from Luke where Jesus says that uh, the householder, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them. That we look forward to the day when Jesus will return, that he himself will be the host in person and he will serve us at the table. We are looking forward to that heavenly feast when we will not just eat symbolically, we will eat directly with him in person. We will be there at his table um, ourselves. So the Lord's Supper, there is such a wonderful blessing in that. It is such a, a, a regular reminder that this is what Jesus has done for us. It's a regular way that we are blessed by him, a, a way that the benefits of his death are given to us. 
And so it is a way that we need to prepare for a, uh, a meal that we prefer, prepare for, a meal that we enter into, a meal that we think carefully about what it means for us as we eat and drink of this bread and this wine. Let me close with some words of um, Psalm 23 and of David thinking of, of um, sharing in this great feast. You prepare a table before me, he says, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. <coughs> Jehovah God, we just want to thank you for your words that you have uh, shared with us today through your man of God. We pray, Lord that the entrance of your word in our life, Lord, that it will give understanding and that the seed that has been sown shall germinate to God. Thank you for expanding to us, explaining to us your body and your blood, what it means and how to give it reference and how to take it with honor and how to eat it and claim healing and how to eat it and connect with you Father, we thank you for the situation around the world and in this country, O oh God. You said in all circumstances we should give thanks. We thank you for the members of this church. Thank you for their job, their businesses. Thank you for their families. Thank you for your church. You said your church is marching on and the gates of us shall not prevail. Father, we appreciate you. We thank you, O oh God, for the Prime Minister. Thank you, O oh God, for all the ministers. Thank you for all the governing bodies of this country. Father, we appreciate you. We thank you, O oh God, for the challenges that everybody is facing uh, with the economy right now. Thank you because you know all things. Thank you because you are the God of our provider. Thank you because you said we shall never lack anything good. Thank you because you said you will make a way where there seems to be no way. Father, we thank you because we rely on your word, O God. Thank you, O God, for those that are mourning, O God, those that have lost their loved ones. Thank you for the sick ones, O God, in the hospitals, O God. Father, we thank you because we know you are the God, our healer. Father, we thank you for situations and circumstances that are very difficult to God. For, for things, O oh God, that look impossible. We know you are the God of impossibility. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you, O oh God, that we can call you our Father and you will never leave nor forsake us. Lord, we thank you for the harvest that is on the way. Um, and we also thank you for Tia Font as well um, that we're going to Come and rejoice and bless you. Thank you for your provisions, O oh God. Thank you for your love and kindnesses. Thank you because on, on you we depend, on you we rely, on you we can do all things. Through you, O oh God, in us. Father, we appreciate you. Lord, we give you praise, we give you worship. We thank you for this new month, O oh God. It's the month that you are going to do a new thing, O oh God. Father, we thank you. You said we should thank you. In all circumstances, we have only come to thank you, Lord. Thank you for the members that are not here today because of one reason or the other. Thank you for all that you have done in our, in our lives, O oh God. We appreciate you, Father. I love you, pray, O oh God. As we thank you, we pray that you meet our needs, O oh God. As we come together, our needs are different. Even though we are here together, we have our individual needs that we need, that we look unto you for. And Father, we thank you because you are going to make a way for us. Thank you, you are going to open doors. Thank you, you are going to do things that is beyond human circumstances. That is beyond human uh, that 
Uman being can I will believe for God. Unbelievable things for God. Father, we appreciate you. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we just commit the rest of the day to your hands. We pray. We shall see you move in our life by your mercy. We shall see you move this week by your mercy. We shall see your glory and your honor in our life for God. And Father, we pray that as we return to our houses, we will give all the glory and all the honor to you. Because you are the one we can rely on. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. There is a
Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.